Next up, ladies and gentlemen, deal maker, hall of fame. May I please invite on stage Shri K. V. Kamath, Chairperson, National Bank for Financing Infrastructure Development, to kindly present this award, deal maker, hall of fame. I request you, sir, to please tell us who the winner is. Any guesses? <laughs> there is a, a deal-making supremo amongst us, and I have a great pleasure in um, calling out Ajay Piramal. Ajay? Attention on the screen. You make us proud. Leading the Piramal Group a global business conglomerate with diverse interests in pharmaceuticals, financial services and real estate with presence in more than 100 markets. Ajay Pirimal has cemented a reputation for responsible entrepreneurship with a strong focus on doing well and doing good, a philosophy that has created long-term value for the group's stakeholders and the community as a whole. Starting at the age of 22 years in his family business, Mr. Piramal has throughout his career helmed many marquee transactions involving some of the biggest names in the domestic and international business market, maintaining a high bar for transparency and corporate governance. In the three decades of its existence, the Piramal Group has pursued a twin strategy of both organic and inorganic growth and currently employs over 10,000 people from 21 diverse nationalities and in the process has created significant value for all its stakeholders. In 2010, he sold branded generic drugs business Pirimal Healthcare to Abbott for $3.7 billion in one of the biggest pharma deals that India has seen. In 2021, Pirimal Group acquired beleaguered housing finance company DHFL for 34,250 crore in one of the biggest M&A deals of the year. In 2020, he bought Carlyle into pharma arm Pirimal Pharma Limited for a minority stake of 20% for 3,523 crore. He has partnered with marquee global investors such as CPPIB, Bain Capital Credit, APG and Ivan Ho Cambridge to set up various alternative investment platforms with billions of dollars in assets under management. The group sold its Decision Resources Group business to US headquartered Clarivit Analytics for $950 million in 2020. A firm believer in the tenets of the Bhagavad Gita, Mr. Pirimal is a passionate advocate of trusteeship and responsible business ethos. He is deeply invested in unlocking India's socio-economic potential through the Pirimal Foundation and is an ardent promoter of social entrepreneurship. A true champion of corporate governance and ethics in business, Mr. Pirimal holds key positions on the boards of several companies and prestigious institutions. He serves on the Harvard Business School's Board of Dean's Advisors, is the co-chair of the UK India CEO Forum and a non-executive director of Tata Sons Limited. Passionate about contributing to education in India, Mr. Pirimal also serves as President and Chairman of Anant National University and Chairman of Pratham Education Foundation. The Dealmaker Hall of Fame Award 2022 celebrates Mr. Pirimal's ability to unlock value through the right investment and deals and his contribution to the investment and deal-making fraternity of India. He has helped boost confidence among investors about the India opportunity. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as I invite on stage Ajay Piramal, Chairman Piramal Group, to receive this award for the Deal Maker Hall of Fame. I'd also like to invite on stage Hemendra Bhai and Swati Piramal Ji. Many, many congratulations, sir. Hemendra Bhai would like to share his thoughts on Ajay Pirimalji being honored this year as the Deal Maker Hall of Fame awardee. I'm so happy to be this occasion where Ajay got this award. And uh, we have Mr. Kamat presenting him this particular award. 
success behind men is a woman in this case is very true <laughs> i know ajay since nearly 60 years can you imagine what age was he at that time his brother and me were very close friends i used to be three four times at least a week uh, in their house ate with him at dinner lunches played cricket next door there was a empty space uh, so we used to have literally a cricket pitch there and net practice and cricket matches were going on so i think that relationship had a lot of impact on my life his father became frankly my advisor uh, guru uh, he told me to before i do something else i should go and spend some time with them so i went as a training in moraji mill in one year's time suddenly i got the head of sales over there i became a, and i learned how to people delegate power uh, to the other uh, people associated with them and i became a local head of moraji mills at the age of 22 uh, i there one year and i realized i can if i can be there and be successful and they made a record profit moraji mills on that year so i thought <laughs> i thought that experience gave me guts in a way to go where nobody was going in the stock market in 1969 so that was the turning point in my life and ajay before him his father was the great deal maker uh, he bought that time miranda uh, philip morris vip and i was the merchant banker for him or investment banker there comes unfortunate uh, his uh, brother passing away and suddenly at a young age uh, ajay uh, takes over charge of the premal piramal group and what you have seen it has been shown here so i don't want to go into his business side of it but what he has done he has kept his all his friends his business associates very close to him his wife swati has various cultural activities fantastic food at home uh, which is uh, think of it that when she will invite me now even in covid time she kept everybody busy in the evening uh, online on various uh, cultural programs historical or music you name it and his son also got involved with that and his daughter so the whole family is so close knitted family and no wonder why ajay is so mentally free to think of business and new ideas uh, i am very happy and very proud of my association with piramal group for so many years 60 years uh, plus so that is the way the past vision and just happened that way that i am here today i am so happy thank you all the best to you ajay piramal ji we must hear from you sir may i please request you to share your thoughts first of all a big thank you to mint and the hindustan times for honoring me and i know that this was a jury of mint so a special even more greater thanks thank you uh, mr kamat you have always been an inspiration that we've looked up to and hemendra has been with us as he said for 60 years and has been always a uh, has been and will always be a part of our family advisor he still told me some good advice even in the few minutes hemendra speaks few words but there is a lot of depth in that so thank you very much <clears throat> my wife swati has been with me through all these times so we are married now 46 years so it's a long time uh, so uh, i want to thank her my kids uh, nandini and her husband peter and anand and his wife isha unfortunately all of them are traveling so they couldn't come but i'm grateful to my whole family they have been the support 
which has allowed me to do so many crazy things. Not always they work out, but they've always stood by me, which is a big thing. In addition, I think I have really had a very good team of people. So uh, you talked about a delegation. I think I learned it uh, from people like my father and Hemendra, so delegation is part of us. So thank you very much, all of you. You know, since this is like a uh, hall of fame or whatever, and it's been a while, so I thought I'll give you just a few lessons I've learned. First of all, I am actually very grateful to Hemendra because when I was 22, he brought what he called a Miranda. He spoke about that. And my father did that deal. And I think uh, my father realized, uh, just asked me to run it. So at 22, here uh, was no experience, but still was running this business. And it was got by him. And it was such a nice business that it gave me a lot of confidence. So I always remember that meeting. I still remember clearly where we were sitting, how we were sitting, and how actually the deal was closed in probably half an hour. Anyway, what are the lessons I've learned? I'm going to quickly talk a little bit uh, through this. One is I've learned that if you have a value-based organization, it creates huge economic value. In the short term, you may feel that there is an expense, but in the long term, it does create economic value. And I can just give you the example of when we entered into pharmaceuticals, we acquired a multinational Nicholas Laboratories. We believed that though the deal was done even later, we must live in letter and spirit of the agreement that we had done. And to cut a long story short, every deal after that, which were any multinational wanted to, in pharmaceuticals, wanted to sell, and there were many who wanted to exit out of India, all of them came to us for the first call. And I think you will remember, Hemendra and Raji were there when Ron Polank was being sold, in fact, we paid a lower price than what another competitor was willing, to be, uh, was willing to pay, only because of our reputation for being value-based. So that's one example I've learned. Second example I want to talk about is that if you have to make an investment decision, particularly in a deal, one must look beyond the headlines. What I mean is that headlines actually only talk about the past, that the growth has been so much, and they just interpret the past into the future. But actually, rather than looking at the past, one needs to look at the future, and that's when, in our experience, value has been created. So when we went, entered pharmaceuticals with this multinational, we acquired it at 0.3 times of sales as the acquisition price because everybody, every uh, paper, every consultant said that pharmaceuticals, particularly MNCs, were, it was not a market for India. This I'm talking in the 80s. And that's what happened. We went beyond that and therefore acquired it at 0.3 times sales. In 2010, when people thought the whole world and all the consultants, I'm, just, I'm not offending anybody, but they all say the same thing. Or the big four or the big ten or whatever say the same thing. So they all said India market is going to boom and it's going to be this and it's the day of patterns and multinationals. So we realized the future didn't look as bright and therefore we sold to Abbott and we got nine times sales as uh, this thing. So it's a... And this has happened again and again. In DHFL, this is the same story. Everybody thought it's bad, but I think it'll turn out better. So anyway, that's the second learn I've heard. Third thing I've learned is that if you have to create extraordinary value, there are two things. You have to buy something which is imperfect, and you have to sell something which is perfect. 
So imperfect, I mean, is that if there are some chinks in the armor, if there are issues, if there are problems, but if you know that you can get to solve them, then there are few people who will actually bid for such assets. And particularly now in this world where there is so much of, you know, there's private equity on one hand, so much of governance, people are not willing to take that risk. But if you can take that risk, then I think, the, and if you can identify that there is value there, then value can be created. <clears throat> That's what we have applied to DHFL, and we think that we will create value. We can see that happening. On the other side, I think when you have to sell, which we've also done, you should sell when your asset is perfect. Because then you get the perfect price. And if you get real value, that's when you get value. We've also done that in our experience. I just talked about Abbott. There are some other ex examples as well. The next learning I have had is that we need to focus on the process which means not really worry about the result. But if you are doing the process right, then the result will follow. It's really the following of the Gita that I'm talking about. There's nothing new that you do what is the process, leave the result. I've seen this through, as you know, sometimes m and processes are very torturous. They are long. You go through their ups and downs. And I can tell you that that time you need to be steady because otherwise one may take a rash decision. And that's what I've learned, that if you are steady, it happened, I know in the last minute when we were signing the deal with Abbott, the guys just made some new excuse that we can't go through with the deal, hoping to get some value. I said, let it be, go home. Nothing happened. Everybody advised me. All my advisors, lawyers said, no, 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 let's agree. I said, we will not agree. And actually it happened. So in DHFL, I know some of my colleagues are here. They'll know we've gone through many process, ups and downs in the process. But if you stick to that, ultimately you will get what you have to. <clears throat> Next thing I feel is that this is 75% of acquisitions actually are not successful. That's some research. I think the main reason for that is ego. It's the ego of the CEO. It's the ego of the chairman who wants his photo in the next newspaper or article and all that. I think we have to leave aside ego and just go on the facts, whether it makes sense or not. And I think it's so important. All of us fall uh, prey to it, and the, it looks obvious, but I thought I would just speak about that. In the same thing, you know, uh, recently, uh, when we sold actually our pharma uh, domestic business, some people asked me, that how come you're selling it, that is your identity, how come you're giving up your identity? I believe that all of us, our identity is not defined by the work we do, it's defined, it's much more. I think we are more important. Uh, we as individuals have an identity. If we realize that, we'll take the right decision and therefore won't depend on deals or, you know, business to have our identity. That's important. If we recognize that, I feel it's better. Finally, I mean, one more thing is that when we acquire, we acquire to invest and grow. We've done that in every business of ours, including DHFL now. When we acquired it, we've already now added 3,000 people in the first six months. We have plans to add another 2,000. We're increasing our branches. We've put in more capital, and we've put in more technology. But importantly also is this concept which I call as the Sangam concept. When you acquire a business, the way we look at it is that how it's a Sangam, where two rivers are meeting. When the Ganga and the Jamuna meet in a Sangam, at the end of the, the river, the merged river, it's not the Ganga, it's not the Jamuna, it's a new river. It has all the it has all the qualities of both the rivers, which is what means that when you acquire something, you respect the other acquirer and the acquired respect each other. What I find many often, especially in multinational large corporations, it's like when the water flows into the ocean. The ocean doesn't change. The largest river in the world flows into the ocean. The ocean's salinity will not change. The 
depth of the ocean doesn't change. But that's why they fail. If you have, if you have equality, they succeed. And I'll just give you one stat. We just did a anonymous <clears throat> feedback session from the people of DHFL that we acquired. And the data just came out today, which I'm going to share with you, that 97% of the people felt that the integration in the first six months has gone well. And 96% said that they understand the vision and strategy and that they've been treated fairly. I think that is the strength of a success. <laughs> Finally, I want to say that all this has happened only because I think I'm really blessed. There is some higher power which guides me through this. Otherwise, you can keep saying this. But honestly, I do believe in it. There is some invisible hand which is helping. I want to make one last point. I think uh, Mr. Kamath spoke about the future of India, and I really believe in it. You know, five trillion economy. But there's one thing that I want to talk about, which we also need to look at in India. And that is that how do we take the underprivileged, how do we raise their levels of uh, their uh, living? In India, there are many parts of the country where our standard of living is far, far below that. The Prime Minister has identified the aspirational districts, 112 of them where 16% of India's population lives, which has only 1.5% of any CSR money going there. And most of the resources of the government also don't reach. You look at the tribals, there are 100 million tribals in India, and some of them you won't even believe they still live in modern India. We talk about digital India, there they are tribes which are still living in, I mean, like two, 300 years uh, before. So I think that's what it is a responsibility of all of us here. I think we are all so privileged here that we should do something. And that is what we as a group also try to do through our foundation. How do we get this seva bhav in people across, the found, across our company and across the country? So with that, I just want to thank you once again for uh, coming this evening for the award that you all have given me and the love that everybody shows. Thank you.